Come back, it's time for us to uh, take our second interview. Valentine Ezi Ozibo is joining me right now. He's the former president and chief executive of Sir Transco Group. Uh, good morning, Mr. Ozibo. Thanks for joining me today. Good morning, Nancy. A pleasure. How are you doing? Fantastic. Doing good. Are you out or are you among those that said, <laughs> let them observe and see what's happening? I dare not risk my life. I'm one of those who uh, feel that uh, I'm not the dove that no ascends after the you know arc, um, the movement in the Bible, biblical days. So I wait and see how things uh, pan out. Pan out. Okay, let, let's let, let's start from that point. Let me have your views about what's happened in the last one month. Like I asked comrade earlier today, uh, the lockdowns at least have been eased partially. Uh, we have some kind of time frame to work and go back home. Uh, what are your views and what do you think will be the implication? Did we open too early? I, I think so. I'm a bit worried. Uh, worried because I think um, we need to be very strategic in our approach, in the things that we do. We shouldn't be reactionary. We shouldn't be cowed by pressure. Um, I know there's a huge um, issue here, conflict between the health crisis and solving the economic issue. Quite frankly, uh, we can learn from a lot of... Can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, let's quickly take a break to reestablish connection uh, with uh, Mr. Valentine Ozibo, the former president and chief executive of Satransco Group. Let's quickly take this break. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back. Uh, Mr. Valentine Ozibo is still joining me. We, we uh, lost the connection. So go ahead. I can hear you. Yes, thank you so much, Nancy. And uh, so basically, I think we have uh, reacted very quickly. Uh, we should learn from what has happened in, in, in Ghana. Uh, the reality is that we need to figure out how to flatten the curve. Flattening the curve actually will mean we still have to isolate and socially and physically distance. And what that means is we need to, of course, ensure that we get everybody to buy plow and we do all the testing and leverage all the data and statistics that are out there and begin to act locally by intervening in different ways at different measures. So what you do in, in kind of course is not what you're going to do in Abuja or Anambra as case, as case may be. But of course, we understand the the need to also deal with the issue of palliative, especially for our people who need to move around and make some money and ease ourselves. And there are ways we can deal with it. And I think there's a lot that can be done in that regard by uh, ensuring that both the government and private sector individuals do more in terms of providing for the needy and for the hungry. So I'm worried that we may be opening up too soon. Yes, I see all the easing um, guidelines. But if we are uh, hit, uh, what kind of story we hear from Kano, for instance, in other locations, we're going to be in a bigger crisis that our own health workers can't contend with. And it may get out of hand that we may start regretting the decision we're taking today. So I want to see a partial easing of this lockdown. I want to see um, things that are economically viable being allowed to continue in places where they are safe to do so. Uh, for instance, um, if we find out that there is no case in uh, in Anambra, I will ban interstate movement in and out of Anambra. But within Anambra, activities can, can go on and ensure that people there can, you know, coexist, cohabit in a manner that still respects all the principles of physical distancing. So I want us to be careful. Uh, let's not uh, go out there if there's no need. Let's only deal with necessities. Let's deal with things that can add food on the table and make sure the common man can survive the lockdown. And this is also when we need to encourage one another to help each other because government alone can't handle it. Okay. Um, you were a former uh, chief executive 
at uh, one of the big companies here in Nigeria. What kind of big decisions do you think that chief executive officers should be coming up with right now? Uh, because some have asked their workers to stay away. Some have converted this lockdown to leaves, annual leaves for their workers. What and what should chief executive officer CEOs be doing right now? Uh, there are going to be several decisions, um, some immediate, which is basically reacting to the circumstance, some more strategic, and, and I'd like to talk on that as well. At this point, it is important that companies figure out how to exist and survive, not even how to make profit, how to just survive. And that could mean um, actually converting uh, those leave days um, as uh, leave days, uh, this uh, lockdown period as leave days. That could mean, in some cases, slashing the salary a little bit. It could mean actually, actually getting some jobs to be at bay at the, at the moment. It's important that the companies exist for the future. But I have to also warn that there are a lot of other things that companies can do, especially in cutting waste. There are a lot of ways that one can cut, and especially in governance, beyond the corporate bodies, in governance, there are a lot of things we can do as Nigerians, as citizens, uh, and even in our individual lives. It's important to ensure that companies and corporates who are grossly affected, and especially in the hospitality space, in the aviation sector, uh, in the value chain sectors, these companies must be able to survive this period by cutting overheads and waste. So for the staff, I like to see how we can have as many people keep their job, but where it becomes inevitable, certain actions may have to be taken. And um, of course, by the time we are able to get done with this, we can get back to normalcy. And let me go back to the issue of the strategic intervention, because um, some actually think that normalcy will return uh, in the immediate future. It's not going to happen so soon. And some, in some cases, a number of things have changed fundamentally. So what do we need to do? What kind of staffing are we going to have to hire? Uh, this is where skill sets even have to change. The issues about critical thinking, complex pr problem solving, and basically getting people to um, attuned to the reality of today and the new world order we're facing, where technology is going to be the order of the day. How do we, you know, ease ourselves into the digitalized world where technology is going to be the order of the day? Uh, a lot of companies have to tell themselves this truth. Would that fit into the new reality? And that is the bigger decision to be taken. And that's where you can separate you know, the fundamental companies from the shafts. And I think there's a lot Oh, it seems uh, the connection is gone again. Uh, we have just a few minutes to the end of the program. Let's take another break. When we come back, we'll conclude. I hope the network would allow us. But keep your comments coming through. I can see some comments on Twitter. Uh, please keep them coming. Moneyline AIT is the ID. You can also reach me at Nancy. Ilo. Let's take this break. We'll be right back. All right, uh, welcome back. Is Mr. Jizigbo joining us right now? Can I see him? Okay. I don't know what's happening right with, with network. These are some of the side, no side, side effects of technology, too. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> and obviously, uh, I'm, I'm dialing from uh, Lagos. I think we have okay. better network here. Maybe it's from your sector. I don't know. <laughs> no, we have good network here, at least in the studio. So I will okay. take it. So I think it's Lagos now. You know, Lagos, you, you people are very, <laughs> you are in another world. <laughs> All right, let's continue. Just as we conclude, you were talking to me about some of the big decisions, and I think perhaps you landed on that. Let me just quickly ask you, 
uh, this question, which is, um, where do you see government going to now? Because it seems that the government, I don't want to say the government is confused, but it's like, okay, the people ask, let's lock down, we lock down. Now the people are asking, let's save livelihoods. We are hungry or we, can't, we will die of hunger. Let me, even be, let me contract coronavirus. We've opened up now. So if you're part of government, what would you do in this situation? It's all about balancing, Nancy. Um, partial lockdown is the answer. You can't free up completely and you can't lock down permanently. We've got to solve our problems our way. So it's going to be partial. Lock down where you need to lock down. And when you lock down, find solutions to the issues because we know the issues. People are hungry. People are going to be in a heat, uh, heated and hot environment. People have no water. People need help. So how do you provide those help? And it's important to also identify that these are symptoms of bad governance we've had over the years. I mean, what Corona has uh, done is to unveil us as we are. And so as we deal with these symptoms, we have to still go back to the fundamental. And those fundamental decisions, uh, if we have time, I'd like to also come into that con those conversation. Mm -hmm. The reality is we've got to balance. Uh, lockdown where you need to lock down. And if you find locations that are free enough to ease off, do so and monitor and check and ensure that people are wearing their masks, people are hygienic, people are observing the social distancing and don't allow aggregation of huge numbers in places we don't have to. Uh, I don't want to mention names of churches and all of that, but reality is where we don't need to you know, uh, allow those gatherings, we shouldn't at this point because we've, we can learn easily from what has happened out there. And we have to embark on massive testing and work with data and statistics. So, so we don't just act based on uh, fake news or in some cases, lies as well. Um, I heard a lot of people, a few people talk about China, what happened in China. Uh, when this happened in Wuhan, there was actually lockdown, but in Beijing and Shanghai, it wasn't the case of the freedom of everywhere. And look at Taiwan. Taiwan, I think, is our best example. They locked all international travels, and they became very, very focused on trying to tackle the issue locally. And they were able to free up the economy. And today, in the past 17 days, Taiwan has a zero case uh, recorded. So how long have they achieved going to that level, especially considering their proximity to China? Those are the things we need to learn from and allow experts lead the way. This is not where you buckle down to pressure because you want to look good in the face of uh, masses. It is important to take difficult decisions if they become the real decisions. Mm. I like that you brought that in the issue of Taiwan because I also had to study what is happening there. A lot of them taking precautions. The government had to do what it did on time. I think it has about 438 cases as, as at yesterday when I checked and no deaths and a lot of recoveries and they are taking a lot of actions uh, right yes. now. As we, as we close the program, um, what, what is your advice right now to government? Because I heard you when you also said that these are symptoms of bad governance. What we're seeing right now, symptoms of what's been happening for years, which we've been yeah. talking about, fix your health system, it's fragile. Nobody can go out now, no big man can go out. Yes. So all of us are here, fix some systems that need to be fixed. So quickly, what do we do? And what is the advice to government at this time? What do we even do as citizens? Quite frankly, um, I like that you asked this question because sometimes we actually have um, you know, temporary inertia, um, um, dementia, where we forget where we're coming from. You may need to cast your mind back, um, 2019, how was that year? We were going through a lot of what we're going through now, unemployment, order of the day, um, obviously hunger. Um, a lot of people, if you were successful in whatever you're doing, you will be getting a lot more calls from people looking for help. And, and now we have a perfect storm with COVID-19 here. We have volatility high, we have you know, uncertainty to the peak, we have complexity, and we have ambiguity. And in some cases, um, also even poor leadership in managing the whole thing. I feel that as we react temporarily and deal with the issues, we have to go back to those fundamental. We need to be able to cut our waste. It's important that we deal with this issue. In, in the corporate world, we have what we call Kaizen, where we're cutting the, 
the moda, the mora, and the mooring, cutting the, the waste, the overburdenness and unevenness. When you actually look at your process and see, are these useful or can be eliminated? And you eliminate one in to be eliminated. Okay. And so things like, um, you know, um, okay. subsidy. Okay, Mr. Zibo, it's, it's time, time, time is not our friend anymore. I, I really need to uh, let us land at this point. Uh, hopefully, in, subsequently, we'll still have you on the program. And let's see how it even goes. The, is, the lockdown yes. has been eased today. Let's watch the situation and see what happens if we also need to re-strategize. So thank you very much okay. for speaking with me on the thank program. Thank you, Nancy. Today. Thank yeah. you, Nancy. All right. Um, I'll be speaking with Valentine Ozibo, the former president and chief executive of SAT uh, Transco Group. Uh, that's the much we can take on today's edition of the program. Thank you all for being a part of the program. But please, as you go out, uh, make sure that you take precautionary measures. Wear your mask, wash your hands regularly if you can, and put your hand sanitizers in your pocket and in your bags and sanitize your hands. I'll see you all. Be the best version of yourself, even during this lockdown. Nancy Naji is my name. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>